No matter who you want the next Miami Hurricanes offensive coordinator to be, here's something I think we could all agree on. You are Locked on Canes, your daily podcast on the Miami Hurricanes, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I am Alex Dono, your host. I'm a University of Miami alumnus, longtime South Florida sports radio vet, and contributor to allhurricanes.com. And thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen each and every day. We're available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. So, yeah, Josh Gaddis is out. I, I know this is already the third episode we've done post Gaddis, but just in case anyone is finding this episode that didn't hear our Friday episodes, Miami Hurricanes do have a vacancy at offensive coordinator in addition to vacancies at wide receivers coach and at quarterbacks coach as well. And when I mention folks that there's something we can all agree on, um, I'm going to address this in some Q&A here because we've been getting great questions from you guys who have been tweeting us at Locked on Canes. And if you follow us at Locked on Canes on Twitter, we will follow you back. Got a question from our pal H. Garcia who says, morning, Dono. Morning, Mr. Garcia. Actually, it's afternoon time now. He wrote this in the morning. Uh, if Coach Mario doesn't hit a home run with the next offensive coach hire, it could be the beginning of the end for Mario, he says. Uh, well, okay, a couple things on that. Um, for as much as I think 99% of the Miami Hurricanes fan base is happy that Josh Gaddis is gone, uh, like, it's one thing we can praise Mario for, you know, doing what was necessary, because I think you had to make this move. We also need to remember, he's the one who hired Josh Gaddis in the first place. So thank you for hopefully correcting your mistake by letting him go. But Mario does have to wear the fact that he's the one who hired Josh Gaddis in the first place. And then second of all, um, you know, we can be, you know, happy that Gaddis has been removed from the equation. But the totality of this move is not done until we see who replaces him. So, you know, thank you for getting that out there. And then the other thing. So, again, when I mentioned there's something that we can all agree on as Miami Hurricanes fans, no matter who you think the next coordinator should be, Miami needs continuity. Continuity is so key here. And obviously all of this is not Mario because he's only heading into his second year. But the Miami Hurricanes are about to hire their fifth different offensive coordinator in six years. Tyler Van Dyke is about to work with his third offensive coordinator in four years. Now, uh, a lack of continuity is obviously terrible. And, you know, you, you never want to have a college quarterback during a, a four-year cycle or a five-year cycle to have to work with, you know, more than like two different offensive coordinators. You never want that. Uh, at the same time, the lack of continuity that Miami has had in recent years, some people are using that as an argument that Gaddis actually should have been retained in order to keep continuity. But no, to me, continuity is only a good thing if you have the right person in place. I don't believe in continuity for the sake of it. Right. If you've got the wrong person in place, you do what you have to do. I don't believe Miami had the right person in place in Josh Gaddis. So that means, again, it reinforces this idea that Mario Cristobal absolutely needs to nail the next hire. And that person that he hires will hopefully be here for at least three years. OK, I think that's an important number, at least three years, because then uh, the next offensive coordinator would get to finish out the Tyler Van Dyke era and then be around at least long enough to give a foundation to the next starting quarterback, whoever that is, probably either Jakari Brown or Emory Williams or hell, maybe even, you know, somebody who comes in in 2024. But, you know, you want turnover is inevitable because if you, if you have coordinators that are doing a good job, they're going to be offered promotions by other programs. So a certain amount of turnover is inevitable. But whoever you hire next, you want them to not only do a really good job, but hopefully be around for at least three years. I think that's something Mario Cristobal has to keep in mind during the search. I think continuity needs to be a consideration on who Mario hires. Now, when, you know, huge names who may or may not be involved in this search, OK, like Dan Mullen, who some people believe could be involved in this search. You know, you also you see the name Cliff Kingsbury get thrown around. I don't think that's ridiculous whatsoever. Uh, but, you know, if you do get a handful of big names like that uh, who are actually in consideration, 
you know, obviously the potential downside to hiring somebody who's trying to bounce right back into head coaching is that if that person were to have great success over their first season or their first two seasons at Miami, then yeah, they're probably going to bolt for the next head coaching job as soon as they get a chance to do so. So it's a really difficult tightrope to walk when you consider these factors, because on the one hand, like you don't necessarily want to hire someone who's not as good just because you think they're going to stay longer. Like if, if you get into a situation, this is purely hypothetical. Okay. If you get into a situation where the two finalists for the OC job are someone like Dan Mullen, who is, you know, so proven as an offensive coordinator and offensive mind. Uh, and, you know, the other finalist is, let's say, Marcus Arroyo, who I'm not saying is a, a terrible candidate, but, you know, I, I, I would say Mullen has proven his offensive coordinating chops more than Marcus Arroyo has. Like, if, if it comes down to two finalists like that, I don't necessarily think Mario should say, well, I'm going to go with Arroyo because I think he'll be here for a lot longer. Like, there are so many things to think about, but I think it does have to be a consideration because you want the next offensive coordinator to be around long enough to hopefully help Tyler Van Dyke have a great 2023 season, but then also help usher in, you know, the post Tyler Van Dyke era. So I, I do think continuity needs to be a consideration, but it's not necessarily the end all be all. So thank you for the question, Mr. Garcia. Uh, we get a question from Eric Flutie, who is uh, turning up frequently now on these Q and A's. He says, Hey, I've got a coaching question. Any possibility of Ed Reed coming back to Miami, he asks, would love to see him more involved with DeMarcus Van Dyke. That would be a hell of a combo. And he also adds, yes, I do have family ties to Doug Flutie. I, I didn't, wow, I didn't realize that. Um, okay, I, I can give a quick uh, answer on this one. This is, this is my opinion, but it's an informed opinion. I don't think I don't think Ed Reed's coming back. Um, I, 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 you know, let, let's remember Mario was not the one to hire him and put him in place uh, in the first place at the chief of staff role. That was kind of a, a job just sort of created out of convenience by Manny Diaz, and it didn't have defined responsibilities. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I just I don't I don't feel like Ed is going to come right back to Miami. I kind of get the feeling he will not be back on the staff. Um, and listen, if, if they can find a way to carve out some kind of a role for him, I, I would love it, but I, I'm not expecting him to land back at Miami. I'm not. Um, okay. We got a couple of great questions I want to get to here in a moment from Trent and from Robert, uh, basically asking for my ideal offensive coordinator candidates. If I can try to come up with someone who checks off all the boxes and I'll tell you folks, it's difficult, right? Because so many of the candidates that we threw around on our Friday evening episode, like you've got certain guys who are great offensive minds, but maybe not the best recruiters or guys who are great recruiters, but not experienced play callers or people who have failed at calling plays in the past. So obviously finding the perfect candidate is probably someone who's a head coach already and may not want to take the job. So I, I think that's a fantastic question. You want to stick around. We have a lot to get to because we're going to talk about more possible names for this Miami Hurricanes offensive coordinator job right here on Locked on Canes. And folks, uh, listen, uh, Josh Gaddis, he might be on LinkedIn jobs right now searching for his next opportunity. And if you're a small business owner or a hiring manager, you know that success in 2023 all depends on the team members you surround yourself with. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals. LinkedIn Jobs helps you quickly attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools. They go beyond resume data by using insights from your job post company and their 875 million member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates. These are just some of the reasons why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to and faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. Even on a Saturday, we're available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. So a question from Trent Lima. 
who tweeted to us at Locked On Canes. And remember, if you follow us at Locked On Canes, we're going to follow you back. And if you tweet us, we may read your tweet on the show. In your opinion, he asks, who would be the best offensive coordinator hire of the options you mentioned on your Friday show, considering play calling, recruiting, relationship building, et cetera? Oh, that's a great question because, again, so many of the candidates that we threw out there uh, are guys who are either excellent recruiters like James Coley and T. Martin, excellent track records as recruiters, but not as good track records as play callers, right? Or, you know, you could throw in someone like a Dan Mullen, who's got an incredible track record as an architect of offenses and play caller, but he doesn't enjoy recruiting. So, you know, just about any candidate you throw out there is probably going to have some kind of a wart, okay? Okay. Now, let me give you a cop-out answer. I'm going to cheat a little bit from my first answer, okay? I think a combination, because remember, Miami has multiple jobs open, not just offensive coordinator. I think a combination of Dan Mullen as the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach with James Coley on the staff as the wide receiver coach, I think that would be a perfect combination because even if Mullen doesn't like to recruit a whole lot, James Coley is such a dynamo recruiter. He could pick up some of that recruiting slack that Mullen may not want to pick up. So I think the, the two of them, assuming they could you know, work together well, uh, I, I think that could be a great combination because, you know, Coley is a great recruiter, but, you know, not, not regarded as the best of play callers, where Mullen is like the best play caller since sliced bread, but he doesn't enjoy recruiting. So, I mean, if I'm going to cheat a little bit, because Miami does have multiple jobs open, I think that would be a pretty interesting combination. But uh, if I, to answer your question though, and you know, I, I save this name for afterwards, because it's just, I, I don't think it's going to excite the fan base as much. But I really do think if I'm going to give you one OC candidate who checks off as many of those boxes as possible, just as a one man answer, Jason Candle might come the closest to checking off all those boxes, in my humble opinion. If you disagree, let me know. That's fine. Because uh, Jason Candle, first of all, like he's on the young side, he's 43 years old. So he's, he's very energetic. His offenses, he's the head coach at Toledo right now. His offenses are almost perfectly balanced, right? Like, and listen, when you, and, and that, that's the goal of a Mario Cristobal offense. They do. I know people always say smash mouth. They only want to run the ball. No, they want to be balanced. Like they, they don't necessarily want to be pass heavy or run heavy. Mario Cristobal wants his offense to be balanced. And Jason Candle has an incredible track record for balanced offenses and balanced play calling. And I think his general philosophy matches up with what Mario Cristobal likes. It's why Mario tried to get him last year before he ended up having to zone in on Josh Gaddis. You know, as far as like, I guess there's more questions you could ask about Candle as a recruiter. Uh, you know, at, at Toledo, it seems like he recruits as, about as well as you could possibly recruit outside the Power Five. But I guess the question mark would come from the fact that uh, I was looking over Candle's resume. He's never worked for a Power 5 staff before. So we don't know how well he would recruit with the big boys, right? Because his college coaching experience has all been with Mount Union and Toledo. So we, you know, we, he's never been on a staff at like a Georgia or a Ohio State or a Tennessee or BAM or anything like that. So I, I guess he just doesn't have a, as much of a track record. But as you know, far as recruiting talent to a place like Toledo, he's done a pretty bang up job there. So I don't know if like a step up in caliber would be a negative thing. That might actually be a, a positive thing for him. Get a similar question from Robert Hutchinson, but I wanted to shout Robert out as well because he's an awesome viewer and listener of the show. He says, who not only would be a good fit as quarterback coach and OC, but who also knows how to recruit. He says, out of all the potential OCs, who would have the most success? He says, wide receiver coach is a need as well. Your thoughts on this hire as well. Um, yeah, you know, there, we, we can throw some names out at wide receiver coach, but I, I think it's, it's kind of difficult to, uh, I, I kind of feel like the OC thing needs to fall into place first. But, you know, I see a lot of people throw out, I mean, James Coley, who we mentioned, that could be a wide receiver coach option. A lot of people bring up Kevin Beard, you know, Miami alum. And he's coached at Miami before. That would be an interesting one. Uh, but for, for the first part of your question, good fit as OC quarterback coach, but who also knows how to recruit. 
obviously I gave you an answer to the previous question with someone like Jason Candle, but I guess if I can add to that answer, like I think another name worth throwing out there is, you know, I, I would love to at least make an approach at Warren Ruggiero, who's the offensive coordinator at Wake Forest. I think he could also be awesome. Now, I know I mentioned one of the things I like about Jason Candle is he's, you know, on the younger side and very hungry. Ruggiero, he's 61, but I am not an ageist, okay? He may be on the older side, but Ruggiero, he runs one of the most progressive offenses in the country at Wake Forest. And I haven't heard anything different about him being a fine recruiter. So if you guys have heard anything, you know, other than that, uh, you know, it seems to me like Ruggiero is another name, but you know, he's again, I, I don't know if he's looking for that big of a change because his job at Wake Forest is very, very steady. So I think you'd probably have to offer someone like Ruggiero a sizable raise to get him to consider an opportunity at Miami. And yes, the same thing can be said for Jason Candle. Let me circle back to that real quick. Cause I know how the comments are going to go like, Dono, why are you talking about Candle? The guy's a head coach. Why would a head coach want to leave his head coaching job to be our coordinator? He already turned down the coordinator job last year. That is true, okay? That is true. But I would never completely rule it out when Candle is making $1.2 million per season at Toledo and Josh Gaddis was just making, reportedly, $1.8 million as offensive coordinator at Miami. So... If you offer him, you know, a few more zeros on the contract, it's not out of the question. I don't think uh, it's less likely, but it's not completely out of the question. So that's why that's why I bring out uh, bring up the name Jason Candle, despite the fact that uh, a lot of you think I shouldn't even be talking about it. OK, uh, we get a question from uh, Island Kane who asks, hey, why not Scott Frost as offensive coordinator, quarterback coach and James Coley as the tight ends coach, he says, and then move Stephen Field to the recruiting department and then have Kevin Beard as the wide receiver coach because he's also a ridiculous recruiter. The thing is, like, why are you trying to do Coach Field dirty like that? <laughs> why are you trying to give Coach Field a demotion? I mean, do, do you think he would be just, yeah, go ahead, take me off the field? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to work. Um, there, there may be that that may just be adding one extra person to the equation. Uh, I don't know if you'd be able to get – and listen, I'd be fine if you bring in Frost as the offensive coordinator quarterback coach because uh, I, I do like Scott Frost. I, I know he had, like, I guess some personal issues at Nebraska, but I, I do believe uh, human beings can learn and grow and change. I mean, look at uh, Steve Sarkeesian not too long ago, seemed unhirable, and then, you know uh, – Nick Saban gave Sark a chance, and he's completely rehabilitated his career and his life. So I, I wouldn't rule that out. Uh, so, yeah, I'd love to have a combo of Frost and Coley or a combo of Frost and Beard. I don't think you can have all three. And I'm, I'm not trying to move my guy Field to the recruiting department. I'm not going to demote him. I'm going to let him keep his spot. I right, got some really good questions about uh, other reasons besides strictly 19.4 points per game and, you know, Miami being five and seven, like why, why Mario had to let Josh Gaddis go. I'm going to answer those questions to the best of my personal abilities. And we'll talk about a few other offensive coordinator names as well. So keep the questions coming guys at locked on canes on Twitter. And if you follow us at locked on canes, we will follow you back. And boy, guys, I hope you've been enjoying the new year so far with delicious treats from built if you don't want all the fat and calories, but you want all the taste, you've got to try a Built Bar. Yeah, we just got through the holidays. And listen, all of our goals have been to eat healthier this year, okay? If you're like me, you want to eat healthy, but you don't want to compromise taste, I've got just the thing for you. You've got to try Built. With Built, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, they're so delicious. You're not going to think that they're good for you, but they are perfect for that New Year's resolution. Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate, and they come in incredible flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond. Guys, I kid you not, shortly before I started this episode, uh, I went on to Built.com, and I ordered my favorite flavor, the brownie batter puffs. They're back for a limited time, so you definitely want to check those out. Because I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing flavors. And they're healthy. The macros are great. 
only 130 calories, only four grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't even need to wait around to get a box. Like for years, we've been talking about ordering your built bars at built.com. And you can still do that with our code locked on 15 for 15% off. But now you can also get them at your local Walmart or Sam's club. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today, head to your nearest Sam club and pick up a box. You can thank me later because I love me some built bars. Thank you so much for making Locked On Canes your first listen today. Make sure you make Locked On College Basketball with Isaac Shade and Andy Patton your second listen. They take you around the college hoops landscape like no other. All the big game, big name guests, players, and coaches, and media members. Locked On College Basketball available free just like this podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Odyssey, and basically wherever you get your podcasts, all right? Rodney B. asks us, so what are some of the off-field reasons that Gaddis was fired for? Um, well, okay. <laughs> only Mario Cristobal truly knows. Like, oh, only Mario Cristobal truly knows why he had to make this move. But uh, listen, I, I can tell you every, every sense that I get from covering the program and, you know, gathering as much information as I possibly can. Um, there were there were relationship issues. You know, you, you clearly saw some of the relationship issues that Gaddis had with players. You saw that manifest with, you know, comments made by players and players' parents on social media. Um, I, I heard, uh, you know, about friction between Gaddis and some of the other coaches on the staff. So I, I think relationships were part of the issue there. Um, you know, I also because, you know, I, I follow recruiting pretty closely and. I don't think anybody on that staff on either side of the football swung and missed on more recruits than Gaddis, who was, you know, the primary uh, recruit recruiter for wide receiver candidates. So, you know, he wasn't carrying his weight, you know, from my perspective anyway, maybe Mario Cristobal has, you know, other, he knows about all the other factors that come into play in recruiting, but from where I sit, uh, the wide receiver coach who was also the offensive coordinator was not pulling his weight in recruiting. Yeah, I, I heard uh, enough stories and got enough sense about relationship issues inside the building. So uh, I, I think that that had a lot to do with it. But again, like I'm, I can only speak for me. I cannot speak for Mario Cristobal. I can assure you I have not had a, a conversation with Mario about, you know, his list of grievances about Coach Gaddis. I, I, I can only infer this from everything that I have observed in uh, in covering the program quite closely over uh, the Josh Gaddis tenure. So that's that's about the best I can answer that question. Nick Green says, what are your top three OCs to grab? He says, mine are Dan Mullen, Marcus Arroyo, or a long shot, Joe Brady. Uh, I, I would definitely, I would be thrilled to have Mullen or Joe Brady. Now, uh, I, I brought up the name Marcus Arroyo so much that I think some of you feel like that's my favorite candidate. But I bring his name up a lot. Same thing with James Coley. Not necessarily because they're my favorites, but because I know these guys have history with Cristobal and they've worked with him well in the past. And so you've got to think that they would be part of the search and that a guy like Arroyo, who he did have success on the field with Cristobal. 2018, 2019, they won two Pac-12s. They won a Rose Bowl together. So that was a, that was a very productive partnership that they had. At the same time, um, I've noticed that Oregon fans are like trolling Miami relentlessly about even the possibility of bring for what that's worth. Right. Cause I, you know, but they're always like, Oh, this guy's terrible. Why would you want Marcus Arroyo? Oh, this, this guy, he put us to sleep with that offense at Oregon. So, uh, take, take it for what you will. Uh, you know, and he's an Arroyo, he keeps things very simple. But um, I, I think uh, as far as I can tell, he's a strong recruiter. And uh, I, I think that he probably has uh, a better ability to adapt to his talent than James Coley had. So I don't necessarily think Arroyo is one of my favorites, but I, I do think it could be a natural fit. Um, I don't know. I, I probably agree, Nick, with two of your three choices. I, Dan Mullen, I like a lot. Joe Brady, obviously I like. He's currently the quarterback's coach with the Buffalo Bills. Um, and I, call me crazy, but I, I kind of like, uh, I kind of like the Scott Frost idea. 
I don't know. I don't know if it would actually materialize or not. I, I feel like he'd probably want the job because what else is he doing these days? Uh, Brent Peterson says, Dono, in a fantasy world, who would Dono like to see as the next Kane's offensive coordinator? All right, so if you're going to let me fantasize about this, because this is this is grounded in very little reality, and some of you might say, well, wow, you could probably shoot bigger than this in a fantasy world. But no, honestly, I'm going to think, because I think about it this way. What name could Mario Cristobal announce tomorrow that would make me feel happier than any other possibility? And I think the name that would probably make me like filled with just warmth would be Ken Dorsey. Right. And, and obviously he's got, of course, the connections to Miami and connections with Mario. So you might say from that standpoint, it would make sense. But I don't think it's that realistic because I, I think Dorsey, he, he's an NFL guy. I think he wants to continue to be an NFL guy. And hopefully in the near future, he becomes a head coach in the National Football League. So I don't think it's that realistic, but it would make me feel so happy to see, you know, my Arguably my my most uh, my most favorite is that grammar my favorite college quarterback of all time to see him coordinating my offense I, I think that would probably make me feel happier than any other offensive coordinator option I, I had one guy tell me on Twitter that his dream offensive coordinator at Miami would be Sean Payton and I'm like look I, I get zero parameters on that one you're just you, you're just basically naming like your favorite offensive guy out there. Um, let's see. We get a question from Shane Castellanos. Thank you so much for tuning in, Shane. He says, uh, this is off the beaten path here for a second. He says, do you fear that Deion Sanders is now the Brian Hartline to the big time defensive backs that we're pursuing? So that reference is from the fact that Brian Hartline at Ohio State is probably the best recruiter of wide receivers in the entire country right now. If you're trying to get a great receiver and heart and heartline wants that receiver, you're probably going to lose out to Brian Hartline. Is Deion Sanders becoming that with defensive backs? Well, yeah, uh, the, the evidence is there. I mean, he just snatched he whose name shall no longer be spoken right out of our midst last week. And he did it to Florida state last year with Travis Hunter. So and it, you know, it, it doesn't even matter where this guy coaches. He could do it at Jackson State. He could do it at Colorado. Like at least Brian Hartline has one of the most historic college football institutions in Ohio State, where he works. Where Dion's doing it at Jackson State in Colorado. It's pretty darn impressive. So yeah, Dion Sanders. No matter where he is, when it comes to defensive back recruiting. He's going to be a thorn not only in Miami's side, but he'll be a thorn in you know Florida State side and Florida side and Ohio State side, Alabama. He'll, he'll be a thorn in everybody's side because he's always going to be competitive when it comes to swiping up some of the top defensive backs in any class. Okay, we get a, a question here from AP Kane's fan. He says, "Dono, why no video about Tyler Lassiter?" So yes. Miami got a commitment last night from Tyler Lasseter. He's a, a linebacker athlete out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Now, he's he's a preferred walk-on. So you will excuse me that with uh, – I had to make multiple Josh Gaddis episodes on Friday. Like I just I, – I couldn't churn out a, a Tyler Lasseter episode. But, okay, well, let, let me give you one for, for Lasseter since he is the newest Miami Hurricane on board. And I also – I don't want to diminish this young man – just because he's a walk-on. I, I think he could have a good career at Miami. So let me give it to you. Tyler Lasseter, welcome to the U! I don't know a lot about this player. Full disclosure. Six foot three, 215 pounds. Um, according to his 24-7 profile, he did get some interest. I don't think he ever got an offer from, but did have some interest from Duke and NC State within the ACC. The only offers that appear confirmed for him were from Columbia in the Ivy League, Butler, and from Presbyterian. So hopefully uh, for Tyler Lasseter, and I, I want to learn more about this player, and hopefully I get a chance to meet him and speak to him at some point during spring football. Uh, hopefully Coach Strong can develop Lasseter into a, a rotational linebacker. He's got good size. I mean, 6'3", 215, maybe a little bit light, but he'll put some weight on. But 6'3", is good size. Hopefully, Coach Strong can help develop him into a rotational linebacker. And, yeah, I imagine that Tyler Lasseter is going to try to have an impact on special teams as well. So 
that will do it for today's episode. Uh, the word of the day is continuity. Hopefully Miami's next offensive coordinator will be around for three years or longer because you're going for now uh, your fifth OC in the past six years. We need some continuity. We'll talk to you next time on another episode of Locked on Canes, part of the awesome Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.